Praise the Lord. Welcome once again to Ridgely Ministries and our Wednesday Words for Life Bible Study. I'm Pastor Patrick. And I'm Lady Takesha. And again, it is an honor that you would join us this evening for our Words for Life Bible Study as we continue in our study of the book of Revelation. Let's open in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this time and this opportunity again, Lord, to study your scriptures and to go into your scriptures and get a deeper understanding of your word. You, God. God, we thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. And so we just ask you in this study, Lord, as we're going deeper into Revelation, that you will illuminate our path and you will light our way. Show us who you are in these scriptures and show us who we are and what you require of us in these times, these last days. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So again, we're in the book of Revelation and this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're continuing and actually we're going to start in chapter 10 uh, and we're going to do chapters 10 and 11 today. Uh, but again, again, I have to say this. I always like to go back to chapter one. Why are we doing the book of Revelation? Because many people steer away from the book of Revelation. They don't want to study it. They don't want to uh, read it. They don't want to know anything about it. Some people think it's too scary, too difficult. But here it is. This is what Jesus is saying in verse three, chapter one, verse three. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So we read it. We are hearing it. The words of this prophecy, but we also keep it. Mm -hmm. Very important. We keep these things. And what does that mean? We obey them. We share them with other people. We get a deeper understanding. We get an understanding of it and we explain it to the believer and the unbeliever alike. So we're being blessed just by having this Bible study Amen. and you are blessed by hearing it, but you will be even more blessed by keeping it. So uh, let's go in. We're in the 10th chapter and uh, this is all about uh, chapters 10 and 11 is all about another parenthesis or another lull before the storm. And when I say the lull before the storm, the storm being the third woe. This is the seventh trumpet judgment. Our previous Bible studies, uh, the trumpet judgments one and two went through the first six trumpets. It has gotten really serious mm -hmm. on earth. Um, we see that uh, the world is being affected on a global scale. We see that there is uh, mass pain, mass anguish, mass everything, and mass destruction, <laughs> mass demons, mass and mass death. A third of another third of the population has died, but we haven't even got to the seventh trumpet, which actually ushers in the uh, seven bowls mm. or the seven vows. And those are the last ones that come that really just, uh, you thought the trumpets were bad. The these bowls and the seals were bad. These bowls just kind of outdoes all of them. So the um, this is kind of a parenthesis though, mm. because God, he's doing two things. Jesus is doing two things in this revelation. He is one, um, filling in the gaps of what is going on as these judgments are happening, mm -hmm. but also he's showing us his grace and his mercy on mankind during this time. So let's start, uh, we're in chapter 10, so open your Bibles and we're gonna go to chapter 10 and we're gonna start at verse one. And this is pretty much the mighty angel and the message. So I've kind of given some subtitles. So chapter 10 is the mighty angel and the message. Verses one through seven. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein 
and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be no time longer. Verse 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So here we are, a mighty angel, and there's always debate, who is this angel? And um, listen to different interpretations. Actually, one says that this is Jesus. Um, I like to uh, lend this to uh, envoy, God's special envoy. So um, not going against the interpretation, whether it's Jesus or not doing this. Again, Jesus is on the throne. Um, he is omnipresent. And he has people to do things for him back on the earth because his second coming is when he touches the earth right. in Gethsemane at the end of the seven year tri tribulation. So we know his first coming was um, him being born in a manger mm -hmm. as a babe and his purpose was to be the sacrifice. And then his second coming is when he comes to the earth to reign over Amen. all the earth After and bring for um, utopia. So that is at the end of the seven year tribulation. So this, I believe, can't be Jesus because this, this angel sets foot mm -hmm. on the earth. And so let's talk about this angel because one, it says he was a mighty angel. Mm -hmm. And so he's got special envoy. He's got special messenger because that's what angel means. Actually means messenger. And so he comes in the power of God. He's a mighty angel, which means it represents God's power because he's representing God. The other thing said, uh, the scripture said he was clothed with a cloud and that represents God's glory. Mm -hmm. uh, remember in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were coming through the wilderness that they were led by a pillar, uh, a cloud by day, and that represented God's glory. But also that cloud will come down to the tent of meeting mm -hmm. to meet with Moses. And so this was his glory or his Shekinah glory yeah. that is um, spoken of in the temple when Solomon finished building the temple, the first temple. So we know this represents, he's clothed with the um, cloud. This is God's glory. But then it says he has a rainbow over his head. Mm -hmm. And that really speaks in, think about the rainbow, the rainbow that the first scene of the rainbow mm -hmm. or the um that was n noted in the bible was in the book of genesis after noah and his families the ark settled and they came out of the ark and the bible says that god put a rainbow in the sky to promise mankind that he would never destroy this was a symbol of his promise that he would never destroy the earth again by a flood but then we also in revelation we see in revelation the fourth chapter mm -hmm. we see that the throne of god has an rainbow uh, around it so we know that this rainbow represents god's faithfulness to keep his promises oh, so yeah. Um, this, this angel has a lot of representation about him and he's coming down to the earth, but also it says his face is like the sun. Mm -hmm. So that speaks of his majesty. Keep in mind, remember Moses, when he ever, whenever he got to, in the presence of God, the Bible says that he, when he came out, they had to put a veil over his face because his face shone because of the glory of God on him. And so this angel is constantly in the presence of God. And that, that speaks to me why his face shone like the sun, Lord, yeah. because he's reflecting the um, majesty and the glory of God. And uh, that's why also the Bible called these um, angels or these beings shining ones right. or burning ones because they're literally, the glory of God is almost uh, mm, the uh, saturated that's them, right. saturated every part of their being. So they're really glowing and uh, reflecting the majesty of God. But then it says his feet are like pillars of fire. Right. And so we talk about sturdiness right. and his majesty, but also his righteous judgment. judgment. Mm -hmm. So he's coming down, he's setting his foot on the uh, sea, on the water, and on the land, which means there is judgment on the entire land. That's right. That this is going to affect the entire globe, the entire earth, both sea and mm. land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so now this special envoy, he he has something specific that he wants to do, and and the Bible says he has a little book in his hand, and and with this book in his hand, he makes a loud shout. He makes and this is him 
Hear ye, hear ye. I always think about um, the special envoy or of the king, and he goes and he holds the scroll, and he says, hear ye, hear ye. He's about to make a declaration, and, and as he's making a loud short shout, this says the seven thunders, there's a voice, uh, seven thunders have sounded, and that represents God's, God himself speaking. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, hear ye, hear, hear ye, hear ye, and God is co-signing what he is about to say, saying, it's almost God saying, yeah, y'all better listen to this one. And so when John hears this, he hears it, it sounds like seven thunders. And we know that is the voice, the of, voice God of God speaking. Keep in mind, again, I, I always like to show the parallels or um, the shadows of things to come. In the New Testament, when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that when he came up out of the water, we know that the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and rested on his shoulder or rested on him. And then they heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, some heard it as God, mm -hmm. the voice of God, but some said it was thunder. thunder. It sounded like thunder. So we know that these seven thunders or the seven spirits or the set, um, represents God himself speaking and co-signing what the um, angel is about to say. But here it is. What the seven thunder says, John is about to write it down. Because it, it wasn't just him saying amen or he proclaims the seven thunders or God himself proclaims something right there. Mm -hmm. He speaks to something right there. And John begins to write it down. And But he is commanded immediately, don't write it down. Seal it up. Don't write it down. And that just speaks to me that there are still some mysteries that are yet to be revealed. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, we couldn't handle it. It's too beyond our comprehension or too beyond too much beyond our understanding. So now this angel is um, making an oath, declaring an oath. And we know in the New Testament it says, don't swear, don't de declare an oath or anything like that. And so people will ask, well, why is that in there? Well, keep in mind, the raptured church has been raptured up. This is now almost gone back to the time of the old covenant. Because, uh, again, this is the time of Jacob's troubles. And this is now the um, coming, the redemption of God's chosen people or the, um, the, the fullness or the fruition of his covenant to Abraham for Abraham's seed or God's chosen people. So now it, we, it's okay to declare an oath. And so this angel was declaring an oath unto God. So let's go back to the um, oath that he declared. Um, let's just read that scripture again. All right. He says this, um, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that therein are that uh, should be no time longer. So here's this oath. He's, he's the swearing this oath by God. So what he's about to say or the message that now is going to be brought to this earth, it is literally from God. It is, and he's swearing by God that this is from God, but this is the fullness of everything that God had um, purpose for mankind, purpose for his creation. It has now come to full fruition. Um, now they're going to see exactly why God did what he did all the way back from Genesis, all the way from back from Genesis up until now. The purpose of this message, again, it's the mystery of God will be finished. So let's go back to Genesis when um, Adam and Eve sinned and there was a prophecy. Uh, and there, there's a prophecy that said in Genesis 3 and 15 that said that you will, well, the seed of, ser of the serpent will bruise the heel seed. of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman shall what? Crush his head. Now this whole prophecy from the beginning mm -hmm. to bring God's creation back to the um, original state is now coming to fruition and is now going to be declared this second half of the tribulation. So um, Isaiah 11 and 9 says this, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord 
as the waters cover the sea. So the knowledge of God, the understanding of God, everything that God has um, purposed and spoken and spoken to his prophets. As uh, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11, it says these things that he's given to his prophets, these things that he's spoken, some has been revealed, but now all things will be revealed and all things will be more than revealed, understood by all mankind. And as we go into chapter 11, we're going to st really start seeing how all mankind will understand that this is all God's purpose for them today. The purpose, the purpose of the redemption of man and the, and the ultimate judgment over the wicked and those who turn away from him. Um, it might sound harsh, but here's the thing about God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. God's righteousness is so far, is so high, as high as the heavens are from the earth. His righteousness is that his ways are not our ways. That's how high his ways are. And so when we see these things unfolding in Revelation, you may say, my goodness, why did it take all that? That's how sinful sin mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And that's how righteous God is. He comes against those who declare themselves as his enemy. Here's the mm -hmm. scripture. Scripture says in John, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But those who don't want to be saved, who are choosing condemnation, are also choosing the righteous judgment of God. And so when I listen to you, Pastor, and I and I, you know, just think about all that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks and to look and hear how his voice is still of thunder, how he's still keeping promises, but also how his judgment will be swift it will be mm -hmm. exact against his enemies that shows that he is the conqueror who is mm -hmm. coming to conquer he is who he says he is and he can do he has the power and this will happen to do the things that he says that he is going to do so his purpose to redeem mankind he has caught up his church mm -hmm. his church is raptured he's still pouring out grace and mercy mm -hmm. to those who've been left behind but who may still want to choose christ at the cost of their life mm -hmm. and he's still showing that i am merciful i'm still a promise keeping god but if i keep promises that i will save and that i will help and that i will rescue from judgment i will also keep promises to my enemies that if you come against me, mm -hmm. no weapon is going to prosper. And everything that you try, everything that you raise up in your own uh, imaginations and in your own uh, rebellion will soon be crushed. And we have to decide now, before the rapture, before mm -hmm. we get to the uh, unfolding of Revelation 10 in the real time, you've got to choose which side you're going to be on. But as we lead uh, through these scriptures and we learn... Um, I pray that people, I pray that you are listening and saying, listen, I, I want to choose the Lord's side. I want to be on his side because when I look at what's coming, mm -hmm. I don't want any part of that. When he has his full revelation, his full knowledge and his full purpose is wide open. You want to make sure that you're on the right side of this war. Amen. So here it is. The mystery of God should be finished. That lets us know that it's um, almost done. It's almost done. <laughs> So just like Jesus on the cross, when he got to the end of his crucifixion, he said, it is finished. This is now, we're getting almost to the end of the culmination of for why, revelation. the why for all of this. And people always ask the question, well, why? Mm. Why did he have to die? Why did he have to do it this way? Why, um, did, why was there the flood? Why, why, why would he wipe out man, women, and child? Why? All of the mysteries, everything is now coming to an end and after that everybody and it's, it, the bible says that the name of jesus every, every knee. knee shall bow every knee and every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is That's lord right. to the glory of god the father there is more to it than you bowing down before him you're going to come to the full understanding why god did what he did that's right and so here it is, it's almost wrapping up. And here's this little parenthesis to say that all these things mm. have been declared and have been um, declared before. The ending was declared at the beginning. And so we're coming now, let's go to verse 8 because um, more specific, he's with a book. The angel's with a book and this book is carrying a very specific message. That's right. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is in the open hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. 
And he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, mm. but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hands and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here is this message. And this message is twofold. One, it is what John is to declare now from this point on mm -hmm. to every, the entire world. So that's me and you reading what he's declaring. And he said, you have to prophesy before many peoples and nations mm -hmm. and tongues. That is all of us. But also this message will be what is who is going to be declaring it in chapter 11. Mm -hmm. So first, let's talk about this message. Uh, if you go to Ezekiel, some background, you can do some study on your own. Ezekiel, the second chapter, verses 8, all the way to the third chapter, verse 15, mm -hmm. it is almost identical, but more in detail, what God is, uh, is speaking of, this message. And so this message, he tells Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel to eat this scroll mm -hmm. or eat this little book or eat this scroll that, um, and it's going to be uh, sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your belly. And, and it really speaks to um, Ezekiel and John taking in this whole message mm -hmm. and not just getting, giving the sugar coated right. version of it or not just giving the sweet part portion of it. But this is going to be bitter. This is going to be a bitter pill to swallow in. And when we think about it, something that is bitter is, you know, it's necessary, but it's not appetizing. It's not appealing. Something that we really want, don't want. I, I said this in the previous Bible study. Um, what was it? Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down because the medicine is bitter, but it's good for you. And so he's telling Ezekiel and he's telling John as the proclaimers. Mm -hmm to let this saturate you completely. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the brevity of this message that this is not just all um, daffodils and tulips running through the meadows, yeah, this but is this heavy. is a ro rose with thorns that it's going to stick you, prick you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be painful. There's going to be some painful things. There's going to be some um, weighty things about it. And so they have to see the seriousness of it, mm -hmm. but so that the hearer of it will see the seriousness of mm -hmm. it, that who they're proclaiming it to, that this is not something that we do with a smile on our face. Uh, so what is this bittersweet message? Um, in a nutshell, it's pretty much God's grace, love, and mercy if you receive him. That's right. If you receive the message, it brings God's grace, his love, and his mercy. But, but here's the bitter <laughs> part. For those who reject it, you, it brings inevitable judgment. So God is a God of infinite love, yes. but he's also infinitely righteous, a righteous judge, Amen. and he must judge sin, and his judgment comes with his wrath. Amen. Sin makes him very angry, and he has to respond to sin the way that is um, significant to his nature, which is holy. He cannot tolerate sin, so he must deal with sin. But if you accept this message... Mm -hmm. You receive his grace, his love, and his mercy. You know what I believe? I believe, and this is just my thinking. This is that I, you know, this mm. is not something that I'm proclaiming. I really believe that God hates sin um, because of what he sees that it does to mm -hmm. his people. Mm -hmm. God loves mm -hmm. people more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, he didn't come to die for the trees as beautiful and as majestic as the skies are and the seas and the oceans and the creeping things and the beasts of the field. He didn't come to die for them. Mm -hmm. He came to die for mankind because he loves with that infinite love. And because sin comes in and corrupts that beauty, corrupts his, uh, just corrupts what he has called his masterpiece, that he himself uh, breathed into his nostrils mm -hmm. the breath of mm -hmm. life. And that man became a living being, became the living soul. And he, he looks and walks and talks and wants to be with them. And he sees that sin separates mm -hmm. man from him. He sees that sin breaks down man's uh, uh, amazingly, wonderfully, skillfully created body. He sees that sin destroys the mind and destroys relationships. And it goes against the things that he has planned for mankind. 
I would hate something too, something that would drive a wedge between me and what I love, I would immediately be hostile to it. And so it's not sin as it's just some ethereal floating kind of mm. something that lands on you. It's the results of sin on what he loves that I believe God really hates. And so he's going to judge that sin. He's going to judge it, but knowing that upon that judgment that he will be able to rescue man that receives and wants to turn away from it. If you want to turn away and be who I created you to be, says God, if you want to turn away from that sin and come and love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you want to reject that sin and then love your neighbor as yourself, then you can be rescued and saved. Mm -hmm. But if you embrace what corrupts, and that's what the scripture says, be not deceived. It's Galatians. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Because if he sows to the flesh, what is he going to reap? He's going to reap corruption. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite of God who is perfection and beauty and love and holiness. But if he reaps to the spirit, he will get life everlasting. And so that is, I really honestly believe that that is why God is so uh, hostile and how he has such a, uh, uh, such a strong passion against it is because of what he sees it does to man. I just wish men could see, mm -hmm. really see with the eyes of revelation, what sin does. So, so here's the bittersweet message. John 3, 36 says this, and anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. That's it. That's pretty sweet. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry life. judgment. So that's the bitter mm -hmm. part of it. And see, we have a lot of, uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, proclaimed preachers today just giving the sweet stuff, the sugar-cutted stuff of his message and not giving, not preaching against sin, not dealing with the sin that is so disruptive mm -hmm. and destructive to mankind and glossing over it and acting like, well, you know, he died for it, so it's okay, you can go back to doing it, but we're not even going to address it. This is why many people don't really teach or preach from Revelation, the book right. of Revelation, because you see how God feels about sin mm -hmm. and how God feels. People really don't preach about and from Corinthians, right. uh, people from Thessalonians, because he really addresses in detail the sin of mankind. So also Mark 16 and 16 says, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Mm -hmm. And this is that bittersweet message that, but it, here's the sweet part of it. Accept it. It, it, it. He has done enough Hallelujah. for you. For you, only you only have to believe and accept this message and accept what Christ has already done for you, and you will have eternal life. You will um, be saved, mm -hmm. and you will escape everything that is coming Amen. upon this earth. So Amen. here's this bittersweet message, Amen. and so. This bittersweet message is now going to be proclaimed very specifically in chapter 11. So we know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. So we know this message is for the entire world. But keep in mind, the seven-year tribulation that we're in now mm -hmm. is for um, primarily for the Jews. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time to bring his Israel, his chosen people into redemption mm -hmm. as a people. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not to discount the uh, Messianic Jews and the Jews that have given their life to Christ right now. They are a part of the church. But re remember, he made a promise to Abraham. And this covenant, he will not break. So he is the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. the nation of the Jews as a people, collective people, still will have the opportunity to be saved. Right. And and here is the seven year tribulation. We are not currently in the seven year no. tribulation. We're in the church. Church we're, is not right. in the tribulation. But the tribulation right here is is what we're sp what we're speaking about and um we're going to see now that we are coming to the fullness of the entire matter. Amen. So let's go over to chapter 11 and uh this is the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet or um I like to say chapter 11 deals with the spiritual life or the spiritual state of Israel. Israel. So mm -hmm. let's go to 11, starting at verse 1, and we're going to read verse starting at verses 1 through 6. All right. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar to, and them that worship therein. Mm, measure them that worship therein. 
but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall tread um, they shall tread under foot forty and two months and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will so here we are the two witnesses and um this is very prevalent and taught quite frequently if anything out of revelation in certain areas in the bible and and so there's always this great debate about these two witnesses and there's right. so many different interpretations mm -hmm. so let's just deal with what the scripture says uh because we believe these are literal individuals mm -hmm. who they are we can we're gonna um give some ideas and you, you can make your come to your own conclusion right. on your own but we know that there's a message mm -hmm. in chapter 10 and so who is going to proclaim this message to the Jews? Because keep in mind, uh, the, the messages has been proclaimed across the world, but now specifically during the time of Jacob's troubles, this message at the beginning of the tribulation, mm -hmm. the seven year tribulation, this message is going to go out. Let me also preface to say, keep in mind, 144,000 Jews, mm -hmm. Jewish evangelists have been sealed and they're going to go out to the whole world. But then there are two witnesses that are going to be right there in Jerusalem mm -hmm. for this 1,260 days testifying right. or giving this message or preaching this message to the Jewish people. So let's, let's back up a little bit. It said um, measuring of the temple. How do we know that this message is for the Jews and specifically where it will be done? He says measure the temple. Where is the temple? The temple is in Jerusalem. Now, keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this a little later with the covenant that the Antichrist is going to um, declare or confirm for seven years and with the Jewish people. And we know and we believe that part of that, uh, part of that covenant is going to be the building of the third temple. Keep in mind, the first temple was built by Solomon. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and then the Second temple was built by when they came out of it after 70 years of exile. They came back and uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. they uh, rebuilt not just the wall but in, in Jerusalem, but they rebuilt the temple again. The temple, the second temple wasn't as grand as the first temple, but as time um, transpired and they went through the uh, intertestament period mm -hmm. and now Rome is in control, here is Herod. Herod says, I want to beautify this temple. And he, he just renovates and makes this extravagant second temple. Mm -hmm. And this extravagant second temple, this is the one that Jesus says, hey, you see this temple right here? Every stone, there's not going to be one stone down. left on top of each other. Down. All of it is going to be destroyed. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute, Jesus. Why would you say that? And actually use that against him mm -hmm. to um, have him crucified. Yeah. This is one of the testimonies against him. He said he's going to destroy the temple. Well, we know after um, Jesus' ascension to heaven in AD 70, right. here we have it. Titus comes in. He destroys the temple. Mm -hmm. Second, the temple is destroyed. Since that time, there has not been a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. If you see the... Um, Temple Mount. Right now, there is a mosque, actually the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and um, there are two mosques on the Temple Mount. So uh, the Jews long for another temple so they can uh, go back to sacrificing and then pretty much uh, um, bring together their uh, religion or their people of faith, their, mm -hmm. their own personal temple as in the days of Solomon, as in the days of um, the people in the first century uh, before the first century church, they want their third temple. So we believe that the Antichrist is going to be a part of the deal that he, when he um, confirms this covenant with the Jewish people. Well, we know that this temple uh, is going to be built. 
And so, you want to say something? Right, 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 <laughs> go right, ahead, go right. ahead. I always think about as Jesus was talking about that, and he's talking about the tearing down of the temple, that he's also speaking that he's going to be destroyed and then be risen up. Yeah, but that was the other. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, so right, they right. got it all mixed up. Right. And say, so you tear this body minute. down. Right, right, mm-hmm. right, right. So then, you know, so hey, here we have, you know, that is a huge affront. When they, when you're talking about the temple, you're talking about a holy site. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so Jesus is being so omniscient that he's already thinking that in three days it's going to come back up again, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. But when you're thinking about the temple, you're talking about, a big, some of us, even when, when you talk about some people's church, they get a little they get a little outside of themselves if you say anything wrong about their church. Now, you take that times 10, times 100, with people who have connected with their God in mm-hmm. this physical building, and because they've already gone through so many traumatic experiences with the tearing down of temples and the losing and the rebuilding and the renovating, and you have kings coming and having to clean out the temple. Mm-hmm. So this was a very important place, the temple, even the symbol of the temple. But when you're talking about tearing down the actual temple, that is going to set them on edge. And even in Al Aqsa, you you there's a big, a big. It's always going to be a place of contention. It's a big place of contention because you have these two faiths. Mm -hmm. Even though there's one true faith, you have this faith, and they both believe that this is a very holy site. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about the building of a temple, and there is going to be a third temple building, and they're preparing for the third temple being built, when you're talking about that, you're uh, you're really setting people of both of both beliefs on mm. edge because you got to tear one down to build up the other. Amen. And so he says, measure the temple of God. <laughs> so that tells us right then that there will be a third temple right. in Jerusalem um, at the temple mile or around the temple, wherever, however they decide it's going to be built. And he says, go and measure it, measure the temple, measure the inner court and measure the people therein. But he says, don't measure the outer court. Because that is for the Gentiles, mm-hmm. and they will tread upon it for 42 months, right. or three and a half years, or 1,260 days. days. So we know that this is a spe- very specific time. We know that there will be Gentiles and unbelievers and people not of the Jewish faith in Jerusalem. So this whole big debate about uh, if it's the Palestinians' land, if it's the Jews' land, and or can we all just get along, and two-member state, and all of that... It tells you right here that it won't be fully occupied by Jews during, even during the tribulation, that the Gentiles will still be there. And this is going to be a part of the covenant. Mm-hmm. So it even speaks of it's possibly that you will have both the mosque and the temple on the Temple Mount. And you got the, the Gentiles there, but you got the Jews focusing on their temple and their inner court and and they're holy holy so and and it and it says this but he's speaking measure it because this message is for the jews and the jews alone Mm -hmm. and so this message is going to be proclaimed to the jews so here it is this witnesses it says the witnesses will testify or will prophesy or will preach for 1260 days Mm -hmm. that's three and a half years so what many people don't understand is they come on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, the, the 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 question is, when does the tribulation start? Is it at the advent of the rapture? Um, I personally believe that it is the advent of the confirmation or the confirming of the covenant. Because he makes a seven-year covenant and that marks the time of the seven-year tribulation. So at the confirmation or at the, um, the declaration of this covenant, the signing of the covenant, these two witnesses are going to appear on the scene. Mm-hmm. From where nobody's going to know, they're going to go right in Jerusalem and they're going to immediately start preaching. This is the same time that the 144,000 are going to get their message and are going to get their um, walking papers and their, um, you know, their great commission to go out to the whole world. So you got the whole world getting the message, the gospel of Christ, Mm -hmm. and you get these two witnesses preaching this message, the good news, the gospel, the, the purpose of everything to the Jewish people. And the scripture says that um, they will have power, verse 3 says they will have power from 
God. And it says, um, they shall prophesy. Mm -hmm. So we know the anointing of God is going to be on them because it says there are two olive trees and the two candlesticks or the lampstand. And that um, speaks of them being the anointed light bearers. They're going to be the anointed light bearers. They're going to bring light in a very dark place because even though this is the Jewish people, even though they're having their new temple built, even though they want to reinstitute animal sacrifice, there's no need for that simply because that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. That speaks to them still rejecting mm -hmm. Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Hamashiach, the Messiah. That is also speaking of them accepting this Antichrist as a Messiah because he allows them to build this third temple. And so this is going to be a very dark time during this time of Jacob's troubles. Mm -hmm. And so for this first three and a half years, these two witnesses are going to be preaching the gospel. Now, the whole question is, who are these two witnesses? So we know that there are two people. Speculation says that it is either Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, or Enoch and Elijah, or Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. We know based on Malachi 3 and 1 and 4 and 5 that it speaks of, in that, especially 4 and 5, in that great and terrible day that Elijah will come with the testimony. So we know and we believe firmly that one of these witnesses will be Elijah. Who is the other one? It could be Enoch, and I just get a little bit of food for thought for you. It could be Enoch and Elijah because neither one of them died. The Bible says in Genesis that Enoch walked with God and then he was without God, took him, raptured him up, a pot so He was caught up to meet um, God in the air. That's the first rapture, actually. So when people say, well, you know, there is no real rapture, it was, it was all throughout the Bible. And then the second one that is documented is Elijah. That's right. Elijah, he get caught up with chariot and fire and he get caught up and Elisha saw him and um, took a double portion of his anointing, a, 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 a double portion of his mantle, mm -hmm. and uh, did twice as much as Elijah did. So we know Elijah was caught up as well. So these two did not die. So uh, Hebrews 9 and 27 says this, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So some uh, are on the side of this is Enoch and Elijah because all men have to die mm -hmm. from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Because I know somebody say, well, what about the rapture? If we rapture up, we won't die. We're the church. They did not represent the bride. So the bride is raptured up, but they were raptured up back in the beginning. So you can come with that from that angle. Um, then others like to say, well, we believe it's Moses and Elijah because remembering the Gospels when the great transfiguration of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the Bible says that he appeared beside him in his transfiguration Moses and Elijah, and they were having a full conversation with him about what? His crucifixion that was to come. So it could be Moses and Elijah because they've already been appearing as two yeah. on earth, bringing a message to Jesus, or it could be Enoch and Elijah. We know it's going to be Elijah, but Enoch and Elijah. The other reason why people think it is Moses and Elijah because of the things that they are going to do. That's right. Yeah. And it says, um, uh, not only is the fire being coming out of their mouth if they are attacked, but it says that they have the power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So here it is. They're going to call, this is Elijah. Remember, Elijah did that in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He was able to speak and no rain and it caused a famine. So uh, they will have the power to shut up and it won't be any rain. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about drought in that area. Will it be worldwide? I believe specifically it will be in the area of Israel mm -hmm. and Jerusalem. And then also the scripture says that they will be able to turn to waters to blood. Who did that? That was Moses during the time of um, in Egypt when Pharaoh would not let God's people go. Mm -hmm. So we know that we see the similarities between what they did then and also the earth with all plagues. Again, that is Moses. So it really leans towards a Moses and Elijah, but we don't know. We don't fight over it. We don't get bent out of shape about it. We agree to disagree, but we do know it will be two individuals testifying and prophesying at that time in Jerusalem to the Jewish people about what, who Jesus really is. Mm -hmm. Scripture also says that they will be in, called in sackcloth. Right. So this is not going to be a happy message. No, 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 no. 
This is not going to be a joyous message. This is going to be, you can imagine they're going, sackcloth represents mourning. So when they put, uh, like in Job, he put himself in sackcloth and put ashes on his head. Mm -hmm. And whenever people mourn, they put themselves in sackcloth and that's like a burlap. It's a very rough garment. It's not a garment that is comfortable and it really speaks to their mourning, the outward expression of mourning. And so they will be walking around in sackcloth preaching and there this is not going to be a happy time because they're going to be declaring that God is real his son is the one true messiah and if y'all don't get y'all act together judgment is coming upon you I wonder what would happen if our preachers and our pastors would just have to change our robes just, to sackcloth just change these fancy <laughs> schmancy robes take off of the, all of this garb that we see all of this all of this fancy things mm -hmm. and really just get bare bones bare knuckles and put on clothing that is not joyous uh, as the scripture is saying you you have these clothes on and you go out and you just preach that message and knowing that people will not receive it knowing it's going to be bittersweet it's going to be bittersweet that it's not going to it's not going to be something that um, people are going to want to hear and you're going to see it even in Isaiah, Isaiah 30, it talks about how people are rebellious, and, and mm -hmm. especially in this time, but that the people at this time and in that will be rebellious. They'll be liars. They don't want to hear what's right. They're going to tell the seers, don't see. They're going to tell the prophets. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell these, listen, prophesy to, us soothe, mm -hmm. prophesy to us smooth things. T tell us deceitful things. We don't want to hear that kind of message. And that's where we are actually right now. Mm -hmm. People don't want to hear the truth. But we have to give it to them anyway. This is what the scripture, the scripture says in 2 Timothy 2 and 42. It says, preach the word. Be mm -hmm. instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all patience. We have to do that even though it, you know, it may result in being unpopular and unfollowed. It may result in death to the extreme mm -hmm. of the message that has to be given. But it is up to us. Let me say that to the pastors. Let me say that to the leaders, to the preachers, to the evangelists. Whether you have a paper or not. You have to preach the message of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ because we don't want people to get to this place. And we know that it might cause, it is going to cause, mm -hmm. it's going to cause all kinds of division because we see now, even with the last election, even with what's going on, people are showing their hand. They are showing whose side they are really on. They are showing what their values really have been the entire time. We are now seeing the oil separate from the water. We are seeing the carnal and the spiritual really manifest. And so the message of holiness, the message of Jesus Christ, the message of peace, the message of love is mm -hmm. not accepted. The message of the, the lamb. Is, is really one that they take for weak and they call us the dissenters now because we mm -hmm. won't go along with the narrative. But I am, I am charging every person who has the word of God in their heart, whether you're a pastor or not, preach this word. Don't give people things to, don't speak to them smooth things. Give them this message so that people might be able to escape this great and terrible day of the Lord. And if we don't, mm -hmm. we are going to have to pay. We are going to have souls to our account that we're going to have to give account for. And he says, listen, at this point, you need to speak the word. And if we can just take this example of the, of the witnesses here, you have to be pretty bold after the rapture to go and to be able to work these miracles and work these things, mm -hmm. you know, but still going around in mourning, still going around in uh, just a, a part where we're not, we're not here for gain. We're not here for money. We're not trying to get an offering. We want you to be saved. We mm -hmm. want you to be uh, to be uh, in the uh, the family of God because the the alternate the alternative is not good. It's just not good. Amen. Amen. So now let's go to uh, verses seven through ten because they're preaching the gospel and um, they're causing plagues to come in the land for those who won't heed and those who are scoffing at them and mm -hmm. those who are right. angry at them and they're causing the um and they're showing that they're legitimately from God because they're um caught doing signs and wonders right. and people um are very angry with them I'm and they're trying you. to attack them and because they're trying to attack them because we I mean this is this is our what we live in today mm -hmm. uh you see um and in Choptown in Seattle, yeah. uh, and what Choptown, where yeah. one guy went in just to tell them about the love of Jesus, and they violently attacked and Shoot choked this out. man out simply because he was giving them the truth. 
uh, and people are now, the persecution on the church is ramping up, even in the United States, it's coming. simply because we are teaching the truth. Think about it. Think about why it is so important for them to keep our doors closed. Because they hate the truth. They hate Jesus Christ. Jesus said, they're going to hate you because of me. Not because That's of the you. They already hate. They hate you because they've already hated me. And the world loves its own. So we can, we're going to see their response now to you. these two witnesses who are giving them the truth. Now, keep in mind. Here's the six seals, mm -hmm. the six trumpets, and during that whole time, these two witnesses are preaching, look, this is why these things are happening. And instead of accepting, well, some do. Some now, do. let me back up because some this do. is God's grace. Right. This is his mercy and his love. So some are coming, but many are still rejecting. So we see now what the response is going to be. Let's go to verse 7. We're going to read verses 7 through 10. It says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three... Oh, stop right there. So we're, um, so we're going to stop at verse 10 and we're going to pick it up in verse 11. So, um, so these two witnesses, this is their response. Um, they tried to kill them these three and a half years. Right. But every time they attacked them, the Bible says in the scriptures that fire came out of their mouth and consumed whoever tried to attack them. So it got to the point where we just let, leave them alone, let them just preach. Right. Because anybody who approached them, you know what's going to happen. Okay, it's interesting because that's something so supernatural that everybody's going to be able to see, but many are still going to reject. Still going to reject. They're going to still reject. So here it is now that the beast comes up and um, the debate is who this beast is. Well, the only time it's talking about the beast is the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist, who is, when he says of the bottom, it sends from the bottomless pit, it tells you the foul nature of this Antichrist. He's going to come with smooth sayings. He's going to come. He's going to be well liked by all. Mm -hmm. He's going to confirm this covenant. He's going to do all these great things for the Jewish people. But his one thorn in his side is going to be those two Wait. witnesses. And there for three and a half years, they're going to be telling everybody this Antichrist. That's that. That's the son of perdition. That is the one that um, is led by Satan. That is the great deceiver. And they're going to be telling the Jews, okay, yeah, they gave you, you building this nice temple, but guess what? He's going to flip the script on you. And so he's going to, they're going to be such a great thorn in the beast or the antichrist side. He is now going to give power to kill them. God is now going to allow for a purpose. For a purpose. So he's going to be emboldened. He's going to come and he's going to finally kill these two prophets now these two um who witnesses now it says when they had finished their testimony now keep in mind it said they will testify for 1260 days three and a half years the first half of the seven year tribulation their, their death is going to mark the end of the first three and a half years by the antichrist killing them now, it's so interesting because two things I wanted to bring out of these scriptures. That the first thing is said, they will be killed. It gives you the location. Right. It says, in that great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt. And so, what were you thinking? And Sodom and Gomorrah was like a distance from where Egypt was. And what exactly is this? This is actually telling you about that great city because it says where our Lord was crucified. Was crucified. Yeah. So, we know that's Jerusalem. But it's telling you the moral and political state of Israel. That Israel was so bad, it was likened unto Sodom. The Jewish people and the, the, the city was that bad. At that level of perversion has now invaded this God city. God said, Jerusalem is mine. And so perversion has gotten so bad that it is said that it is the city of Sodom and Egypt. Mm -hmm. We now going to see... 
that this is going to be the epicenter of the worship of many gods. Mm -hmm. Um, that we know that Israel had a God for everything. They had a God for the frogs, a God for the Nile, Egypt. a God for death. What did I just Egypt. say? I'm sorry, Egypt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That Egypt had a God for everything. So, right. so we see now the, but also when I say the political state, that it will be ingrained in their politics. Mm -hmm. That their laws are going to be built around this um, um, polytheistic um, society. Mm -hmm. And so this this moral and and, and idolatrous state of Israel is going to be, it tells you this is where the witnesses are going to be killed. So it also gives you not just the timeline, but the location. So that tells you exactly where these um, two witnesses are prophesying. But then it says when they are killed, it says the whole world sees this. 50 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. That's right. This is how amazing the scriptures are. In the 70s, they couldn't fathom this. Right. Not even 50 years ago. In the 70s, trying to understand, they just glossed over this scripture. And they really, and I remember hearing the interpretation even in the 80s, where it said that um, the population will be diminished so much so that people would like gravitate towards the um, Middle East. Because that will be the seat of power of the Antichrist, the new Babylon. And I, when we talked about this in a previous Bible study, in Iraq, Syria, the U, river Euphrates, this will be the seat, the, the new Babylon, the seat of the Antichrist. And he's just going to want everybody closer to him because it'll be easy to get the food to you, the resources and things like that. No, there'll be people all over the world. Well, in the 87 AIDS, they couldn't fathom that you could actually see somebody be um, killed in real time. Right. Now, keep in mind, remember, when the jihadists start beheading Christians and beheading people, they were posted on the internet, and it wasn't just an upload video. Sometimes it was live. Right. They will post a live video, and the whole world will be able to see it. Now, in the advent, as technology continues to increase, you can see things in real time. It will be an earthquake over and on the other side of the planet. And as soon as somebody pop up their phone, start recording it, you can actually see it That's live. Right. That's right. Or you can kind of, you don't even have to DVR things. You can go right on the internet and catch what happened a minute ago, an hour ago, a day ago. So the whole, but the whole world will be able to televise. Keep this in mind because the Antichrist is going to be a media hall. And everything he does is going to be, he, he's going to be epitome of um, self-idolatry. Mm -hmm. He is going to be the penultimate selfie person. He's going to use social media to be about the me, 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 our eyes on me. So he's going to catch this plan. I'm going to kill these witnesses. He's going to know he's been given power. Because it's already written in scripture. That's right. At the end of the three and a half years, now you can go and kill him. So he's going to know exactly when. He's going to have it on the calendar marked on the day. Probably. It's going to be an X on the day. Kill the witness. It's going to be on his itinerary. He's his, his um, special assistant, executive assistant said, oh, what do I have on tap today? Um, on your, um, they're going to be looking at his calendar and say, oh, you're supposed to kill the witnesses today. So he'll be able to go kill the, and he's going to go and he's going to have the media, the new, he's going to have everybody, all cameras going to be out. Because here's the Antichrist coming upon these two witnesses who've been the bane of our existence for three and a half years. And what he's going to do, he's going to kill it and all eyes will see it. Mm -hmm. But then here's the other part that this always gets my goat. Unbelievable. It says they will not only celebrate as one, but they will send gifts, gifts to each other. They will cash at one another. Uh, they will send Amazon gifts. Amazon Prime with the um, with the um, the um, flying things, <laughs> with the drones, drones right. dropping it off at your doorstep from the warehouse that is right up the street. They will be able to send gifts to one another in real time all over the world. We didn't have this technology until what about five years ago? That's right. Less than that. And they were only dead for three and a half. And they were only dead for three and a half days. So it's not like months and months and people all, uh, a month later, I say, oh, yeah, I got your gift in the mail. No, they will be able to send things, gifts in real time all over the world. This is amazing because it was prophesied That's even the type of technology we would have right. in this day. That's right. That's, That's right. how specific God's word is. If you just pay attention.
very simple sayings will even tell you what is going on today. That also shows us how close we are. Mm -hmm. That shows us how close we are mm -hmm. to um, to this whole thing wrapping mm -hmm. up. Not just the end of all days mm -hmm. during that great and terrible day, but that just lets you know how close we are to the rapture. Because we have the technology mm -hmm. to do all the things that they're saying. They didn't see this 50 years ago, 40 years ago, are they? Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. didn't see and be, they didn't have these types of capabilities. But that shows you not only how close we are to the end, but how even closer we are to the rapture. Amen. So now let's go to what happened after that. So they're right. dead in the street, right. three and a half days. Now, by this time, surely, Lord, they stinketh. But nobody will put them in a grave because they... It's just like our society today. Uh, if you think about um, even in the Middle East when they kill their enemies and they let their bodies lay out and they got the cameras on them and they just let it as an example. And um, we see the depravity of our society throughout, not just now, but even throughout. They will put oh, their, de their dead on pikes that's and right. hang them in the um, marketplace and just let them sit there hanging as the crows are plucking out their eyes and things. That's the depravity of their society. They hung Jesus. When they crucified people, they left them there on the cross. The only reason they took Jesus off in a short period of time because uh, of the exactly. Sabbath. And um, here, and they had to get a petition That's right. to remove his body off of the cross. So we see that the depravity of man has not changed. And so now these bodies are laying in the street and everybody's celebrating and having a party and they're just laying out there and um, then something happens. Let's go to uh, verse 11. Verse 11 says, And after three days, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, into the witnesses, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them and the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the god of heaven mm -mm -mm. Go ahead, verse 14 i do it the second woe is past and behold the third woe cometh quickly so they're celebrating, they're finally dead, these thorns in our side, they shut up the rain, they caused plagues upon us because we laughed and scorned, they tried to kill them, and now they're dead, we're celebrating, and after three and a half days, wait a minute, what do you mean they're getting up? Because cameras are still on the site, and oh, everyone you know. is seeing them you know. dead and celebrating. It's a party, it's party time. We have finally got rid of these banes of our existence. What do you mean they're getting up? Breaking news. They're getting up. The Bible says the spirit of God, the spirit of life from God. Remember, when God formed man, he what? Breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. Right. So that same, he breathed back into them and breaking news, they're getting on their feet. What do you mean they're getting on their feet? It's been three and a half days. We know don't nobody laugh. Oh, wait a minute. Then Jesus, oh, oh, shoot. Ah, man. It's God again. Yes, Here we go. <laughs> so they get up off their feet, but it don't stop there. They hear from heaven. Come up, come up hither. My, my, my. And they get raptured up. Look at that. So this is so amazing because this is God putting his stamp and saying, Hey, y'all, remember three and a half years ago when millions of people and children disappeared? That was me. Yeah. That wasn't aliens. That's right. That wasn't some freak of nature. That wasn't... uh. Uh, radiation. Climate that change. Cli what well, climate change? <laughs> we don't wonder about this climate change thing. Right. I think climate change is going to be the excuse to say why these people disappear. I don't know what's going on. I believe that's me. <laughs> it's crazy. The gospel according to Patrick. Climate change is the excuse why millions of people will disappear. No, it was God. No. And so three and a half years after the seals, after the trumpets, after everything, these witnesses, the 144,000, all the things that are going on, God's going to say, hey, that rapture that they were talking about, yeah, that was me. Hallelujah. And let me show you, with these two witnesses, the Bible says that he says, come up hither. That's why I believe when the rapture of the church happens, we're going to hear, come, come up, up hither. hither. Everybody Hallelujah. else is going to hear a shout and a thunder and a trumpet and a shout of the angel. We're going to hear, come up hither, hear and name. we're going to be what? Caught up in the cloud yeah, uh, to meet him in the air. Yeah. So now they're going to be caught up, and they're going to go back to heaven, and 
Everybody is going to be in shock. But look, and this is God's response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only am I going to rapture up my witnesses, Glory my God. faithful, but I'm going to, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, everybody wanted to co-sign their death. This is my response to you. The Bible says there's going to be a great earthquake. Look at that. A seven tenth times. of that city, Jerusalem, will fall, and 7,000 will die. My, my, my. Oh, you really wanted to celebrate the murder of my faithful witnesses? This is how I'm going to respond to you. I'm a God of love and mercy. That's why they were preaching the good news and giving you the truth and telling you what's right. But I'm also got to judge sin, and you just murdered. And here's the Bible. Not only did they, those who did it, but those who what? Took pleasure Pleasure. in it. Romans 1. So I'm going to get... All of y'all. So this great earthquake, a tenth of the Jerusalem city fell, and 7,000 died. And so here's man's response. Did they and begin, and the other response was, and they would not repent from last Bible right. study, that's from right. the trumpet that's judgment, right. from right. the sixth trumpet, they would not repent. Now, all of a sudden, and the fear of God fell on them, and they gave glory to God, glory to God. the God of heaven. Hallelujah. They recognized that this is all God's doing, and it ends with, and the two woes have finally passed. <laughs> the first three and a half years are the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments, and now here comes the six um six judgments, mm-hmm. the first and second woe trumpet judgments, but now here comes the seventh, and the seventh is interesting because it is so significant. Mm-hmm. It ushers in the last part of the tribulation or the last three and a half years. And we're going to end um, with uh, starting at verses 15 through 19. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worship God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And should and shouldest destroy them, there it is, which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. So this trumpet sounds and it is proclaiming the great anticipation of Christ's reign. Hallelujah. There's only three and a half years now to the millennial kingdom. Glory to God. There's only three and a half years Woo. for the second coming of Christ where he's going to come down. He's going to institute a perfect utopia and he's going to reign with a rod of iron. And that his saints are going to, that were raptured up the bride, is going to come back with him and they will reign with him on the earth. For a thousand years. It is proclaiming that all of these things are finally leading up and the time is short and we only have three and a half years for all things to come into fruition. That all things will come to pass. Everything that was been prophesied by the prophets, everything that was spoken of in the old covenant and the new covenant, everything that we preached as from the pulpits, everything about the redemption of man, but not just the redemption of man. The redemption of man is complete. But now he's coming with judgment to and he's coming with reward. Hallelujah. He's coming to, against the wicked and he's coming to reward his prophets and his saints and them that fear his name, small and great. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's coming to judge the wicked and for those who hurt the earth and destroy and come against his prophets and come against his saints. He is coming in the, his fullness. The seventh trumpet is a full proclamation of what is about to happen. Huh. But there's something that needs to happen before that. There's something that needs to happen before that. So we're going to stay tuned mm-hmm. as we move into <laughs> Revelation. Because this is, it's amazing because you would think, well, why is this the, like the third woe? This is just a great proclamation. Because it ushers in what is even worse than the trumpet judgments. But 
also very important. It tells of his covenant. It reinstitute or re um, affirms his covenant yes. with his chosen people because this is the time of Jacob's troubles. Mm -hmm. And so now here the, it speaks of the ark in heaven. And we know the ark represents not just his covenant with his chosen people, but also it represents his mercy. Hallelujah. Because the mercy, the mercy seat which seat. covered the ark and in it was the testament or the the law or how we should live as christians or how we should live as his chosen people and 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 so the ark in heaven is not just the covenant with um the jewish people mm -hmm. but it's the covenant where whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved so now this 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 ark of the covenant has is there and, and open up and the temple is open and you see this ark of the covenant and it's talking about this covenant with god's people but then there is, as it says, lightnings and voices and thunderings and, and an earthquake and great hail again. And that, okay, well, that's pretty bad. It is. But it's just ushering in what is to come. One more time. Because what is to come is going to come upon the unholy trinity, Satan, the antichrist, and the false prophet, and everybody that takes the mark of the beast and worships the beast that these bold judgments are specifically for them but he will now keep those who he has a covenant Hallelujah. with whether they're tribulation saints whether they're the remnant mm -hmm. whether that he is going to seal and keep and protect during the last three and a half years there's a lot that's now going to happen and we just want you to stay tuned mm -hmm. to our future bible studies as we continue in our study of revelation our time is up god bless you um we hope you have enjoyed this bible study and that you have really gained something from it and more importantly that this is a message that you too can share with whomever does not know jesus christ that you can share in your church with mm -hmm. people who may not understand the book of revelation and have some trepidation about studying it and that you will actually take this this message and yeah. even though it will be bitter in your belly it will be sweet yeah. in your mouth because it will remind you of his grace his love and his mercy yeah. don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel share and like our videos like them but more importantly share them so others will hear this good news that we are sharing throughout the world we're not doing it to see how many views we get we just wanted to get to at least one more person so that they, they can have to have the opportunity at the good news at choosing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or being encouraged as a believer in these last and evil days. Let me just close in a um, moment of prayer uh, as we close this Bible study. Gracious Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this time. And Hallelujah. we thank you for this Bible study and as time is far spent, but... Lord, we can even spend more time with you as we continue in your word and continue in our private time with you, God. And we just lift up those who are hearing it, that they have full understanding of what we have said, God, and that they will not only apply to their lives, but they will share it with someone else. God, keep your people in these last days that we will be the church of Philadelphia and that when we say Maranatha, even so, Lord, come, that first you will come for your church, your bride, which will include all of us who call in your name. And we count it down by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. To you I give the glory. To you I give the honor. To you I give the glory.